Welcome to Pro Bull Talk, where it's all talk and no bull. Get ready to slide and ride. All right, let's go, boys. Hustle. Come on, come on, man. Let's go, let's go. Woo! Man, man, let's go. This episode is brought to you by Sutherland Logistics. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Pro Bull Talk. Today we got Brandon Wren, Cody Hart, and Blake Skaggs, and a very special guest. This guy was uh, a shoot boss for the NFR for about Oh, from 82 to 2012, Daryl Barron. How you doing, guys? We're good, doing good. good. Doing good, buddy. Uh, so you've been uh, feeding some cows this morning, looks like. Been out and about? Been out and about feeding the cows, dodged the rain so far, <laughs> and it's all good. Well, there ain't nothing wrong with a little rain in Texas this time of year. No, we need, we, we need it bad. We're still behind, but it's looking better. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, how did you get into being a shoot boss at the NFR? Well, it was a kind of a funny deal. Uh, when I worked for Harry Vole for years and picked up for him, and there we got know. to Cheyenne one year, and he said, I need you to go over and run the bucking shoots. I said, I, I didn't hire on to run the bucking shoots. I hired on to pick up. <laughs> I got I had to go over there. He gave me the Harry Vole. I got to have you. So I go over and started running the bucking shoots. Well, that kind of just took off from there. So I would still pick up and run the bucking shoots. And so we got the college finals. Uh, Harry got the contract at the college finals. And uh, I ran both ends of the arena there. And uh, Sean Davis came on board a few years after that uh, at the College of Southern Idaho. And then he became the president of the PRCA. When he became the president in 82, he called me and said, hey, I need you to come up here and run the shoots in Oklahoma City. I said, well, I'm really not interested in doing that. He said, well, you you do it up at the college finals. I said, yeah, it's a little different than college guys from these pro guys. But he taught me into going, and, that, and that's how it started. Yeah. And uh, so and you, you started in 82 and went to 2012. And uh, how did uh, – back from 82 and then it moved to Vegas in 85, what was the change there? Well, there was a lot of changes that uh, – obstacles we had to overcome. In Oklahoma City, it was such a – uh, great setup there, the way that, you know, you load all the livestock and the way the contestants access and aggress the arena, and that was great. And we went into Thomas and Mack, and, of course, uh, there was only one tunnel coming down into the arena. Mm-hmm. And the other tunnel was a, there was a uh, dumpster in that. So you had to bring all the stock around that for about two years before they got moved around. So there was a lot of obstacles. There was no access for the timed event contestants from the uh, east end of the arena either. So we had a moat in the arena mm-hmm. where the contestant, event contestants had to go down that moat to go to the other end. So it took a long time to get all the little bugs worked out right. for that thing to, to really get scrutinized where you could really have a, you know, really watch your time schedules and keep that thing in a timely manner. Uh, as far as the running of the rodeo, it, it just got better and better and better uh, of us coordinating with the contestants, coordinating with the judges coordinating with the tv people and everything to make that thing smoother and smoother all the time yeah because i've watched some of the videos uh you know the old nfr tapes like in the 70s and early 80s you've seen a lot of the contestants i mean it almost kind of looked like they had their like bull riders had their stuff hanging in <laughs> the arena and they was all standing out around the edges of the arena and bucket when you got to vegas that didn't happen well we we had changed that during the college finals i kept the arena real clear and Sean liked that. He said, that's something I want to incorporate in Las Vegas. He yeah. said, there's people down there that have no business down there, which there were. There was a lot yeah. of people down there that were just, you know, it was like walking into any rodeo. Anybody could yeah. walk in down there. And um, that started changing when we were in uh, at the Myriad in Oklahoma City, trying to keep that arena clear and make it look more professional and having guys, you know, access to arena from behind and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and it was and it was safer for everybody, too, you know. Oh, Sure. Well, sure. Now, Oklahoma City it was a, it was quite a bit bigger arena than 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 Las Vegas, the Thomas and Mack. Oh no, no doubt about it. Uh, the Myriad, I think, was about a hundred and eighty feet long, and Thomas and Mack's only one hundred and forty. Yeah. So there's there was, it might even been one hundred ninety in Oklahoma City. Why did they move from Oklahoma City to Vegas? Well, uh, Las Vegas really went after the national finals for it to move to. Uh, to Las Vegas. Uh, Benny Benning was a, a big proponent in getting that thing moved out there. Of course, he and Sean Davis were close friends. And uh, Benny wanted that thing out there. There was in, in, in December in Las Vegas, there was nothing going on. It was a dead time of the year for 30 days. There was no nothing happening. 
and they wanted to bring something into the city that would uh, promote their growth and promote something going on in the city. So they put up so much money, the the PRCA couldn't hardly turn it down because contestants, you know, were trying to make more money. And it just, the, the growth pattern and the way it just progressed along, it was just so much better. Every every, every year it got better and better and better. Right. And, and you could see the, the way they treated the contestants out there was even better. Yeah, I mean, the whole town got involved because I we went out there the first or second year, and I was just a little kid then. And they had all the bareback riders at one hotel, the bull riders at another, team ropers at another. Each hotel kind of took care of each each event. Exactly, exactly, and that was how they they started getting the hotels involved because they said we'll have all these contestants stay here. They can sign autographs. We can draw some people to your hotel and your facilities and your gaming, and and uh, they really started the marketing push. Uh, really took off about that time, about eighty four. It really took mm. off eighty five, eighty six. And each of the more of the hotels got involved and more outside stuff started happening. And by the nineties, there was so much, many things going on. Uh, the cowboy trade show that started out at Cashman field, which mm-hmm. was the civic center. Then it got so big. It had to move to the, to the uh, place where it's at now, uh, to the, to the civic, to the new civic center. And there were just so many things going on. And then each hotel was starting to have their own trade show. The Sands had a trade show. The South Point had a trade show. The M- You know, it's just mm-hmm. so huge now. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And now, you know, now you just almost there, there's several hotels out there that has viewing parties for them to come in and watch the NFL set and watch in the ballroom and watch the NFR instead of having to go to the mm-hmm. arena and, and all that. Um, it's, it's amazing to talk to people say, yeah, I'm going to the NFR. And then you. They get home, you say, well, how was it? Did you enjoy it? Did you have good seats? Well, we went We went to a watch party. We never went to the <laughs> yeah. <arena>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at them watch parties, they do drawings and door prizes and yep. all kinds yep. of stuff. And uh, They they play the national anthem just like everybody mm-hmm. stands up and mm-hmm. uh, you know, shows tribute to the flag, and they play the national anthem. They they do everything just like they're sitting in the arena, and, the, and during the breaks and stuff, they have uh, drawings, like you say. Mm-hmm. They have games going on. They got contests. Dodge was the Ram was the one that big started that thing. Started those watch parties. Yeah. They started having it at the South Point, but now there's several watch parties going on uh, during the NFR. Yep, I think the first yeah. watch party I ever went to out there was in the '80s. Uh, was the Sands Hotel Casino out there? They had a big watch party, and I mean it was big. Cool. They had a big screen and everything, tables and chairs set out, free beer. I was too young to drink, <laughs> but. Uh, they so, had it all set up. So how hard was it to get selected to be the shoot boss at the NFR? Was you selected? Were you appointed for that many years? Every year you had to you had to put in your nomination. You had to nominate yourself to be put in. And the National Finals Radio Commission every year voted on who was going to be the personnel, the shoot boss, the, uh, you know, the time event shoot boss, the ride event shoot boss, the livestock uh, superintendent, the timers, the secretaries, <clears throat> the announcers, so the NFRC controlled all that who was in there, you know, and I was just blessed enough to, you know, be on the inside track and I guess do a good enough job. They let me go back for 30 years, you know. Wow. Yeah. So, are you, so are you in uh, the PRCA Hall of Fame? I mean, that's a bit huge accomplishment. Oh, I'm, in, I'm in the Texas Rodeo Cowboy Hall of Fame and I'm in the Cheyenne Frontier Days Hall of Fame. Dang. Did you dollars. shoot boss Cheyenne? Uh, I was a shoot boss at Cheyenne for uh, about 28 years. Wow. wow i didn't i was I did was, you do I was any of the other big rodeos yeah uh there was a lot of other rodeos i did i did uh I, I worked for the pro rough stock guys for about five years i did their deal uh, i used to go do several rodeos for benny butler i used to go do the lawton oklahoma and abilene in texas for him and i would go to several other rodeos during the year for him uh, i went to the uh rodeo in Browning, montana at the on the blackfoot reservation john smith had a pro rodeo there i went there a few times so I had I had several rodeos going on uh, even after I retired from Copenhagen. I had five or six pretty good rodeos. Yeah, that's another thing. Copenhagen's gold back in the day. I mean, it, yeah. it was a big part of of rodeo and kind of brought things front and center. That was a, that was a good deal way back in the day. They were they were a very progressive company with excellent people. Their promotions were uh, phenomenal. Uh, they had sponsored contestants. You know, we were we were on the cutting edge just like everybody else when the sponsored contestants came around. Uh, to have some great guys like like Cody and Ross Coleman and Justin McBride and Ty Murray and Trevor Brazil, I can go on and on. When we were we had some really top guys, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was a big time, and 
Did you, didn't you you uh, remember when PBR had the, the deal in Houston? Didn't you shoot balls at a time or two? The Justin World Bull Riding Championship. Yeah, I did, did the Houston Bull Riding one time down there at the Summit. I think. Yeah, the Summit. Yep. Yeah, I thought yep. so. I thought I remembered you doing that. Yeah, did, I was. I was yep. curious. Did you have to have so many rodeos to nominate yourself to be the shoot boss? Well, or no. M- mostly with the rodeos, like Cheyenne Frontier days, those guys would just contract me. You know, directly. <clears throat> you know, if I went and did a rodeo for Benny Butler, he would he would call me. Him or Rhett would call me and come to a certain specific rodeo to do a rodeo for them. But most of the times, the committee of the stock contractor call me to come run the shoots for them or get involved with the production. Like at Browning, Montana, uh, I ran the shoots for them, and Steve Kenyon, the announcer, and I we did the we did their opening and everything for them. Yeah. Well, how did how did you get into the picking up? Did you did you ever compete in an event with your bull rider, team rover? What I mean, how did you get into the the picking up part as well? I started out riding bareback horses. Okay, I uh, was had had two or three scholarships to go play football, but I was had my mind said I was going to go rodeo, and I got a rodeo scholarship to the University of Southern Colorado in Pueblo. Uh, competed in five events. Competed at every event with the bronc riding. I uh, went to the college finals twice. I uh, was a steer wrestling champion there once. Our team was uh, <clears throat> second in the nation one year and third in the nation the next year. But at the pro rodeos, I just concentrated on the bareback ride and the steer wrestling was my two better events. You know, and I team roped some. But along the way, early on, I started picking up for the Ratchin brothers at the Cowbell Rodeo in, in oh, Mansfield, man. Texas. man. <laughs> Jackie Ratchin and them. Yeah, that's where I got started picking up. And... Uh, Harry Vole needed somebody to pick up at a college rodeo, which I was going to, and somebody told him I picked up, and he he came and found me, and he used to buy a lot of bulls from the ranches, so I kind of knew him, mm-hmm. and uh, so that's how it started out. So I picked up the college rodeo for him in uh, '72 there at Lubbock, and he said, uh, "Hey, how about you come and work me this summer and picking up?" I said, "Okay." So that's how it started <laughs> be working for him. I got you. I got you. You know, you look at you look at the NFR all the years you were there, all them years you were there. If you're a fan of rodeo, the greats, I mean, the, the greatest bull riders, the greatest rough stock guys, time events that come through there, is there any one, any one of those guys that, that you see when they first come on scene that you thought that's that's the guy, that's the next world champ, or is it like, like we are now? I mean, them guys, them new guns are just coming in and going at it. I mean, you, you went through some good times. I'll tell you a funny story. We were at Mile City, Montana, uh, when I worked for Copenhagen, we were putting on this deal called the Ride of Champions, and it was the top 30 Bronc riders in the world. And uh, Walt Garrison and Charlie Daniels, Matt Rope, Larry Mahan, and Bud Pauly. That was the kind oh, of feature wow. event. And so when Larry showed up there, I forget what year this was. This was Ty, was, Ty Murray was about 12 or 14. I got pictures of him when he was just a little bitty guy. And he shows up with Ty Murray, and he tells Larry Mahan, told Walt Garrison, this guy will be the next world champion. Walt said, yeah, whatever. So I watched Ty from the time he was 14 or 15 come all the way through to what all the things that he accomplished, you know. So he was one guy I got to watch all the way, and you could tell just the look in his eye, he was dedicated to being a world champion, and that's what he was going to do, and he was going to follow in Mahan's footsteps, and he did that. He sure did. Yeah, but there was a lot of other guys along the way that you watched progress along. Uh, I mean, even J.W. Hart, the first few years, he, he come around, you know. I mean, that, that one year, first year he won the world, I don't think he rode three bulls at the finals that year. Who? But uh, watching, and, and Cody will remember that, but you watch him progress along, you know, guys like him that would come along. Then you got watch guys in the Bronx riding like Glenn O'Neill that started out, and they were just pretty good, and then they got better and better and better. <laughs> There was just so many of those guys that got better and better because they, you know, they really dedicated themselves to being the best they could be in their event. Right. Well, JW, you talking about my brother, JW? Is that what you yeah. talking about? Yeah. He never won the world title. He never went no, to the I, NFR either. But JW Harris. Oh, JW, JW Harris. Harris. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was I was thinking yeah. you you threw us all off for a week yeah. here, and everybody was kind of looking at me, and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I don't think I missed that. <laughs> wrong, wrong, JW. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, JW, come on. Well, back in the early eighty, the mid eighties, you know, when you went to Vegas, you had Ted Noose and Lane Frost and Tough, Clint and Bronger, the, uh, Jim Sharp. Yeah, uh, them guys. Uh, hey. Lacey Kathy was yeah, a Lacey stud. Yeah, Lacey Kathy. Uh, there, there was guys you just you just couldn't throw off. 
Yeah. I mean, you, you knew when when Tough, Ty, Cody Lambert, uh, and, and Marty uh, Stannard. Yeah. You know those guys. Those guys, you, you just couldn't throw those guys off. I mean, and the and the Bulls were so much different. And they were a bunch of big yanking mm-hmm. harder, no timing. You know, it, the bull riding was so much different then uh, compared to the bull riding today, where the Bulls are so much faster and so much more athletic. Uh, but I, I'd love to see some of those matchups today. And I know I know you guys have probably talked about that to see some of these matchups of the guys of that era with the Bulls of today. Yeah, that would that would oh, be yeah. some good watching if we could go back and just you know Personally, do that. I think, just I think they would. Spank I mean, them, but I, I would love to go back in my prime one time <laughs> and get on get on something, uh, you know, like Bruiser, or Bushwhacker, or Asteroid, or something like that. That would be uh, that would Speaking be. Speaking of fun. them guys, though, there's a story about Jim Sharp. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. At the tenth round, then FR, he come in late, missed. He got fined because he missed the grand entry. He come in late with a hot dog and a Coke in his hand, shapped up, ready to go, fixing to ride the tent pool. Yeah, he'd rode all nine so far coming into the tent. Yeah. This is a story that I've been getting. Do you remember any of that? Yeah, he walked up behind the bucket with a hot dog and a Coke, getting ready to get on the bull. And he was late? <laughs> and he, well, he, was, he, just, he just showed up at the last minute. He missed the grand entry somehow. Uh, I'm sure he overslept or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> overslept in Vegas. <laughs> he, he showed up like nothing was wrong, and he was where he was supposed to be, and, you know, nothing really phased Jim. He just kind of rolled with the flow and uh, got on that bull. I think he had a bull of butlers, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think it was, I think it was four of butlers, I think. Yeah. Well, before we, go any, I, I, before we go any further, let's hear from our great sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Gloria Cranch. Hey guys, y'all just heard from Laura Cranch. If you like our set, you see what see what we got here. If you like it, give them guys a call. Them pretty ladies up there at Laura Cranch Home Furnishings, give them a call and they can hook you up with some cool stuff. That's a always every every week we're here, every month we're here, every episode we have all the furniture from them, and they're yeah. they're great gals. You if, need to go down there and visit with them. If you like something on our set, then uh, you can sure go to that store and buy it from them. So, go ahead, Blake. So back to the Jim Sharp. Did you uh, did you ever have to get it, get on ever anybody like to hurry who up and slow? get after them? Yeah, who was the slowest and yeah. Who did you have to really get on? I hate to start pointing fingers, but there were some guys, there were some guys that were slower than other guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going. I hate to pick on anybody, but there were some guys that were slower than other guys. <laughs> you know, the thing about being a shoot boss, people always say, "Well, what, what's your main job?" And my main job was to keep the flow of the event moving, but at the same time, try to keep a contestant, whatever event it was, keep them on their game plan. And you really need to know your contestant and know their mannerisms and know their, all the little things they did to get ready because that could help a person so much to keep them on track. Because if you could keep them on track, you could keep the flow of the rodeo moving yeah. at the pace you want it to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think people consider those things today. I think they're just, you know, you you, you hear the guys on the telecast today, they're just hollering, come on, come on, yeah. come on. I mean, and, I. You know, I remember back when 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 me and JW were riding in the PBR, and he was super slow. I mean, and he's my brother, and I can I can tell you this, and, I, and anybody that rode with him knows that he was super slow. But and, and I guess I I might be giving him a kudos here, and I hate to do it, but he would start two guys before he would start pulling his rope two guys before him, and when it when they when the shoot you know the shoot the gate opener and all that got over there, he was just about ready. And and he would get oh, yeah. out of there, but he would start earlier. And I, I think nowadays some of these Brazilians need to start right before the anthem. <laughs> well, there's, there's no doubt about that. You know, the thing about it, the NFR, they put in a ground rule that said that you must be pulling your rope when the previous animal leaves the arena. So that yeah. meant everything that you needed to do to be ready, to be ready at that time to pull your rope, you, had, you needed to get all that stuff done. And uh, another thing, being a shoot boss, was telling those guys, hey, there's five ahead of you, there's six ahead of you, there's three ahead of you. Yeah. And, you know, try those guys prepared so yeah. they could know what they had to do. Because everybody had their own little mannerisms, you know, that they had to do to, to get ready. I don't mm-hmm. care what it was. Yeah. Uh, chaps buckling their vest, you know, putting their mouthpiece in, you know, things they did with their hands and feet. 
or if bronc- everybody had these little idiosyncrasies they did, you know. Or in the bareback and the bronc ride and go ahead and cinch up and be ready and tied off and, you know, ready to go. Yeah, in the bar- in the bareback ride, it said you had to have all your gear ready, basically, and have your hand in the arena when the previous animal was leaving the arena. In the bronc ride, it said you had to be mounting your horse when the, when the bucking horse was leaving the arena. Yeah. So... You try to keep those guys on that same – you try to keep that same flow going all the time. I'd always wait until the pickup man got back to their spot before I'd ask a guy to nod. I always try to keep the same rhythm all the time, you know, so it was the same all the way through. And once he catches the rhythm, and if it's if it's a good rhythm, it's going good, if you can't stop it or you can't slow that down, you just try to maintain that. Yeah. Yeah. So how – to be honest, how nervous was you the first NFR you went to? You know, is, was it a different feeling for you, even being like the shoot boss? You hear the contestants talk about it, but oh was yeah, that- it was uh, every performance at the NFR. Every thirty, the, all the thirty times I did it, the first performance I was a nervous wreck. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I tried to contain, contain my composure, and I always made always had a great crew. That was always the best part of my job. I had a great crew. Everybody knew their job, and everybody knew where to be. And I didn't worry so much about them, but I was just, it was kind of like a kickoff at a football game. You know, you're anticipating that kickoff and it's the same way you're anticipating telling that first bareback rider, how hey, you're clear to go. And yeah. once they're there, it just took off from there like a fire. So yeah. when you are selected to be the shoot boss, do you pick your own guys to your own crew to put together? Yeah. You get to select your own crew. Okay. When I first started out, you got to pick your own assistant shoot boss. And then after we moved to Vegas a few years down the road, Sean, he would uh, he would recommend certain guys he thought would be good to come in there and and help, and uh, so I worked with different guys. Uh, Gary McDaniel, I worked with him and Mark Baker the longest. Each of those guys were with me about twelve years. They knew the routine. Uh, they were great to work with, and you know the contestants respected them because they were both, you know, from around the rodeo business, and everybody knew them. And that was the other part having some respect from the contestant because. If you're asking somebody to do something you'd never done, you know, they're kind of looking at you like, yeah, whatever. But if they knew that you had been there and done that, they, they knew that you weren't trying to put them in a bad situation because you didn't – the last thing you wanted somebody to do was take a bad nod. I'd, I'd always tell them, guys, you, you nod bad, that's your fault. Don't don't nod bad. Don't take one bad. If it's as good as he's going to get, this is as good as he's going to get, you just got to make a decision and nod your head. You've been there, Cody, on them kind of bulls. Mm-hmm. You just get them as good as you can get them and you got to go. Yep. Some of them, you know, you just know they're not ever going to get perfect. They're not going to get right. You just got to take your take your best shot and get out of there. There's some bulldogs that's, out there that's, that don't that's understand just a, that, though. That's just the luck of the draw. Sometimes and this is kind there of. Was, oh, go ahead. There was a big head. He came from Howard Harris. He was his number was eight. He was old black ball face horn bull shorty T, and he would squat down so bad in the shoots. They finally started putting a lot of people won't even remember what this is, but there was a wood coat box and they used to put a wood coat box underneath him. So he couldn't squat. <laughs> <laughs> Did that ever happen at the NFR? Uh, no, we've had uh, all kinds of stuff to happen at the NFR. Survey had that bull HR that was so big. He couldn't get in the shoots and he had to tie a rope behind him because you couldn't yeah. shut the slide gate. Uh, we've had to do it before. There, there was different things of, of bulls you had to do with you know with boards and uh, blocks and stuff like that. Uh, pops under their neck and different things. You know, rope around their horn. Right. Uh, most of the time, then guys like you said knew the bull. They knew what they had to overcome to get a, a shot at that bull to nod their head. Yeah. You know, as you look back all them years, what what's the funniest story you can remember? of something that we wouldn't know about, that nobody, unless you were there, would know about some funny story that happened at the NFR over all them years? Uh, Well, there's a lot of them. Some of them I don't think I can tell. There was a lot of funny. The, the funniest story, I'll tell you all the funniest story that happened. One year, Jerry Dornkamp and Ty Murray, they were big buddies. They hung out together and joked and laughed all the time. Well, it seemed like, Two or three nights in a row, Jerry and I and Ty were sitting together watching the barrel race, and, and you know, Ty was always jacking with somebody, and he was jacking with Jerry. And it had been about three performances, and Ty hadn't even rode a bull past the end of the gate. So he's telling me, and Jerry said, yeah, I got to go out there to that trade show tomorrow. He said, them people are going to be all over me. I need to get some kind of costume or something. Jerry said, well, go dressed as a bull rider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I did not, I did not think that was funny. 
Oh, but it was it was pretty funny. We we laughed on that one. Yes, on that one. I bet <laughs> that <laughs> was a good one. <laughs> well, that was a, that was a good shot. But that most of the stuff that happened that was funny was little things like that that happened behind yeah. the bucket shoots. You know, waiting for something, to, waiting for another event to start or something to go on. Uh, there was just a there was another one. There was a guy there, a stock contractor. I won't mention any names again. I'll leave this anonymous. But he was a new stock contractor, and he got in the rodeo business, and he was, bless his heart, just got to know anything about bucking stock. And he had a big, wide horse. And he had, certainly he had a big, wide horse that looked just like him. So when I walked around the corner there, he's trying to put this halter on his horse's service, and I, and I started up there to say, hey, you got the wrong horse. Well, they stopped me. Fred Dornkamp stopped me and said, let's, let's see how this goes. I said, well, that mare ain't never had a halter on. He goes, I know that, but he don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> this went on for about 10 minutes. This guy's a great big heavy set guy. And by the time he gets a halter on his horse, this guy's in a lather of sweat. I mean, he his shirt tails out. His pants are hanging down. He gets off the fence and pulls his pants up and tucks his shirt tail in. Fred Dornkamp walks up and said, uh, Tracy, I hate to tell you this, but uh, that bear of ours doesn't need a halter. That's your horse right behind her. <laughs> <laughs> That's my but favorite was, part about all the years of rodeo is the story. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah, definitely. There was, but there was a lot of little things like that that happened that, you know, Chuck Logue was the worst in the world. He couldn't remember one bareback horse from the other. You just had to lead him to his horse and say, this is your horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going back on YouTube and watching videos. Uh, when Tuff got hung up in, I think it was 90, were you one of the crew that was out there working the hang up? Was that you up on top untying him? Hell no, I was up on top of the gate watching. Somebody said, oh. I, used to, I used to carry about three knives with me. And somebody said, why didn't you get there? You got the sharpest knife. I said, there was too much going on. There were too many butchers already in there. I didn't want to get cut. <laughs> <laughs> Ro- Roach Heedman, I think he was the one that finally got yeah. finally got it cut, I think. Yeah. But there, I think there was I think there was eight or nine guys that were down on the ground with, mm-hmm. with Tuff when he yeah. got hung up. That was the, probably the worst hang up I've ever seen. Yeah, that was one of them, I promise. That was, it lasted for a long time. Come find out, he had put a, a wedge underneath his glove so he would he wouldn't kind of like binded it in like a bareback ride and put your hand in a rig and kind of bind it up like that. And Yeah, I kind of heard something about that. <laughs> it wasn't long after that. Well, right after that happened, my, my dad got in my ass and said, you are not to do it. Don't ever think about doing that, young man. If you can't hang on to it, you don't need to put that in there. Never heard of yeah, that. I don't, I don't think that was very smart at the time. Luckily, that bull was gentle enough. He wasn't trying to kill nobody. It, it wasn't like a lot of bulls that, that would have been bad to hung up to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of them back in the day. I wouldn't want to hang up to Mr. T back then. Oh. That would have oh. not That would have not been smooth. Or bo- bodacious. Yeah, bodacious, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a lot of them little quick-footed bulls from the West Coast. You sure would have been hung up, wouldn't be hung up to mm. either. Yeah, them little rats on acids, what I called them. <laughs> <laughs> they were they them. I tell you what, them kiss drowny bulls. I tell you what, them bulls mm-hmm. were electric. Now, mm-hmm. when yeah. did when did the uh, the Wrangler bullfights like when did they did they start before you started and when did they end? I started I actually started in Oklahoma City. We had the Wrangler bullfights with the Nest T Challenge, which was a uh, high school rodeo association. So during the afternoons, two afternoons during Oklahoma City, we had the Nest T Challenge, and I think we rode. Uh, bareback horses and Bronx and uh they ran barrels and i think they might have broke calves but they had the ranger bullfights that's where they started actually and uh the the ranger bullfight you know uh that was a phenomenal uh promotion you know that ranger put together and of course at that time they had you know some really outstanding guys that were fighting bulls at that time you know from skipper to miles to rick to you know, Rex Dunn, all those guys. I can't even think of all those guys in that area. They were just so phenomenal, you know. And, uh, of course, you know, all them bulls that started out was all them big brindles of Jim Sutton's and then Harry Vold got to raising those bulls. And, uh, you know, all the, the Mexican breed started coming in. But they, it actually started in Oklahoma City, and then it when it got to Vegas, it became part of the show at the closing, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a great promotion. Yeah. Great you- promotion. You remember when Rex got smoked? I remember it. You talking about Oklahoma City? Rex Dunn, yeah, when he got he got laid out, run over, and smoked down. Rex Rex made a move on this bull, but the, he he didn't make a big enough move. And I mean, this bull ran the length of him. It was probably mm-hmm. as hard. 
I've ever seen anybody get hit uh-huh. standing flat. And uh, the only other one I ever seen, Steve Mallory, he got hit kind of like that on the back of a barrel one time. A bull hit him coming straight on him at the back of a barrel, broke his uh, collarbone, uh, yeah. broke his sternum, actually. Uh, that was a bad, bad wreck. But uh, there was a lot of them guys in that Ranger bullfight that took some some terrible hookings. Now, yeah. Now, was you ever you was you ever standing in the rainy when they turned purple people eater or crooked nose out? Uh, I was working for Harry Bo when we bought purple people eater. He was at uh, Lubbock, Texas. He was in a feedlot, and he was telling me about this bull that Charlie Thompson said was over in his feedlot, and they couldn't get him out of the feedlot. And anyway, we somehow got him. Uh, they got him up in a corral and we went to get him and we took him over there to the college pens where we were keeping all the livestock. And I said, where are you going? What are you thinking about putting that bull? He said, well, he'll stay with these other bulls. I said, he wouldn't stay in the feedlot over there at the, at the sale barn. I said, he ain't going to stay here. <laughs> well, sure enough, the next morning we drove back up there and that bull, he was about 16 hands tall. I mean, Ooh. he was, he was that tall. He was huge. And of course we all got there real early because we knew he wasn't going to be there. And sure enough, he wasn't there. Harry said, well, Big D, where do you think that bull's at? I said, well, I'm down there with them heifers down at the other end of the college farm. I'm just guessing. And Harry had a 1973 yellow Cadillac with a white vinyl top on it. So he says, I'm going to go down there and see if this bull's down there. Well, Jeff Dornkamp, he jumped in the truck to go with him with the, the Cadillac. Well, they were gone about 10 minutes, and they came back, and the whole left front fender of the Cadillac was caved in. I said, I see you found the bull. He said, yeah, we found him. We found him. He's down there. Well, anyway... We found out this bull had been roped so much, you could rope him. He would lead like a dog. It was it was amazing. That's how we loaded him. we just go back there and rope him. you rope him on the fence and hand your rope up and pass the rope up and load him. But uh, <laughs> Harry had these bulls out of Canada. They were half Mexican and half Bramer. They came from a guy named Fred Burton. And these were the wildest cows I'd ever been around in my life. I mean, they were scary. And when you gathered them, you didn't say a word. You just gathered them real quiet, kind of like you were gathering wild horses. But he started breeding uh, purple peat leader to them Mexican cows, and that's where his that's where crooked nose and one forty one and all those great fighting bulls he had came from. Oh, out of that man. was out of that breed. I was wondering where he got crooked nose from. Did y'all ever try to buck purple peat leader? I tell you what, there was a great story about that. We were, had him in El Paso, Texas, one year, and he had them horse Cody members these days when none of them bulls were tipped. This bull had needle sharp <laughs> horns, so Harry decided he's going to put him in the draw. Well, Lyle Sankey had him. He said, Harry, you need to tip that bull. I ain't getting on that bull, that bull like that. So there was a guy that worked for Harry named Paul Schultz, and he was an ordained minister, and everybody called him Preacher Paul. So Harry says, Preacher, go get your shoeing tools. We're going to get this bull in here. We'll trim him. Trim him. So we got him in the chute, and Lyle, thank you there. He's overseeing all this, and he comes up there with his shoeing tools. And uh, Lyle looked down at his feet, and he said, Harry, his feet look good. I don't think we need to do anything to his feet. <laughs> <laughs> Horns. We tied this bull in and we trimmed him down, got him down to about a quarter size is all we got him down to. And Lyle said that was good enough. This bull jumped out of there with Lyle Sankey. He turned back to the left. I mean, kicked over the top of his head. He was 88 points on him. And that was the only time we ever bucked him. Wow. Oh, wow. Man. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Dennis Davis Bucking Bulls, Gloria Cranch, Sutherland Logistics. Blake Skaggs Bucking Bulls, Print and Stitch Company, Benchmark Custom Buckles and Western Jewelry, SK Leather, Kirk Martin Logging, The Hat Shack, and Cactus Rodeo. Did y'all ever buck Crooked Nose? Uh, I, I was gone when he had Crooked Nose, but I don't think he ever bucked him. But there was three or four of them little bulls, like 44. He was a Mexican cross. He turned back and bucked, and he, he was good. He was good to get on. He was like a 20-point bull. You could you know place on him every time. Uh, and he fought real good, but uh, most of those bulls, they were just fighting bulls. Yeah. Well, back in the day, a lot of times, a lot of contractors would, you know, put a fighting bull in the draw, and whoever had him was the last guy out, and that's what what they sold the show with was the. So if you ever entered a pro rodeo and you was the last guy out, you probably didn't want to even go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and then and then it got to where those guys got that figured out, and so they would just have a mount out bull, you know, and they would get them guys on them for ten bucks. There was a guy from uh, New Jersey, uh, George Schmidt was his name, and he got on a Bramer one time at Fort Worth with a great big hump, and he put his arms around that bull's hump and bit him on the hump and nodded for him with no rope or nothing. 
He must have wanted ten bucks pretty damn bad. <laughs> yeah. Hey, ten bucks, ten bucks. Uh oh. Yeah, crazy stuff guys did back in our day. You know that uh, that what that happened. But uh, yeah, George Smith, he was something now. Wow, that's like Smurf riding bad company, riding party that. animal backwards or drinking a beer or something. Yeah. Oh yeah, those guys. Smurf's another guy that had a lot of talent. You know. Mm-hmm. You know, him and Smith and all them guys. Uh, Rob Smith came to El Paso one year. I wasn't there. I was finishing up my college, and I couldn't get the couldn't get away to go to the rodeo to El Paso one year because it was always in February, and I was in my last year of school. And uh, Rob Smith drove over there and told Harry he wanted to fight the Purple People Eater, and he wasn't even he wasn't even the bullfighter at the rodeo. But they said it was the most phenomenal bullfight you ever seen. They said Rob crawled to him and went to him like you can't imagine. I'll be dang. Which but one do you think was better? I'm, I'm, a better fighting bull. What's which, that? Which one you think was a better fighting bull? Crooked nose? Because I hear more about crooked nose. A lot of people don't even know who Purple, Purple People, people Eater is. They look at me like Purple People Eater. I'm like, oh man, you got to know. But oh, which yeah. one you think was the better one? More uh, crooked fierce. nose was crooked nose in in my estimation was the better, way better fighting bull as far as you know what he could do and the things he did. Harry asked those guys, he said, uh, what does it sound like when he's running at you? And Miles Harry said, he sounded like a locomotive. You can hear him hitting the ground and blowing. And he said, that's all you can hear. Hmm. And uh, he, it was pretty scary. But that bull that Benny had, uh, something demon, yeah. spotted demon. Yeah. Well, that that was a bad Jose, too, now. That was a bad bull. Yeah. Them, yeah. them two stick out in my mind as two of the better fighting bulls there was i mean there's been a lot of them i don't even know about but those those two guys from my era they really stood out well why you know they they had the bullfights you know the wrangler bullfights after the nfr a lot for throughout the 80s and i think even the end of the early 90s i think why did they ever stop that do you know you know i don't, I don't know i i I don't know why they stopped having it. I know they were uh, having trouble. You know, they had to put up a lot of money for the purse for those guys. And I think it was a, a burden on the committees to put up that purse, you know. Yeah. I think that was part of the problem. But I think that Ranger felt like that they, they had, you know, outgrown that promotion and wanted to move on into something else, I believe. Huh. But, but I, always, uh, I always love watching them. It would be interesting to bring it back, even. Yeah. I mean. But there's so many bullfights out there today, you know, and – that Rosinski guy and those guys are out there today that, that those guys are phenomenal, you know, and the stuff they do and the, the fighting bulls and the, just the special setups they have for them. I haven't only, I've only seen them on YouTube and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but, uh, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on out there today with bullfighting. Yeah. You go out to NFR now and there's, there's tents set up in hotel parking lots and stuff and, and there's fighting bulls everywhere. And there's yeah. like, was it the BFO and BFO you know, or resort world? They have that yeah. deal. And, um, their finals are out there along with some other stuff and it's it's on every corner out there now. Yeah, but there's bullfighting everywhere. I'm just I'm just glad I'm not the livestock trooper didn't have to take care of all them fighting bulls. <laughs> <laughs> well see now early on when y'all first got to first got to Vegas, wasn't the bull housing right next to like in the parking lot of Thomas and Mac? It still is. Is it really? No. I thought they moved it over somewhere else. I think they run well, them down the block, don't they, or something? Housing, the housing was more uh, due west of the of the Thomas and Mac uh, in the early days. It was in part of it was in the parking lot, but then as time went on, it moved over to the kind of the northwest a little bit there. And there's a permanent spot there they have it now, and uh, there's lanes that go all the way down through there where they can just bring everything up and you know uh, you. choreograph pretty much everything what you want. That was one thing that in Oklahoma City there was it was kind of hard to get back there you had to go every night sit down with buster ivory and howard harris and tell them exactly how to load the horses how you want them loaded how you want the bulls loaded be so it would coincide with my order i was going to go and uh it was kind of a nightmare because there was no system and so i started working on a system there uh which later i come up with a computer system to actually do all that on computer so we actually when they were drawing when the secretary was drawing i would draw on my computer then after the rodeo was over, we would sit there and get the order. There was an order every night. It changed every night based upon the world standings. Mm -hmm. And you would have to go in a certain order. And you didn't have to go right in order, but they wanted you to keep as close as you could. Yeah. The biggest thing in the horse riding is I was trying to get those horses where they need to go because the contractor's trying to win something. His horse, the contestant's trying to win something. And then in the bull riding, there were certain bulls you just 
you had to have it at certain spots for them to have their best day, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of that coordination that had to be done behind the scenes. So when everything came up in there, it was a pretty much choreographed, kind of like the PBR does today, tell yeah. you what you're familiar with. They choreograph yeah. because they know exactly what shoot this bull is coming out of four mm-hmm. hours before the event starts, yeah. you know. It's the, same way, it's the same way at the NFR now. You know, they pretty much followed the system that I kind of built. Until there's a rewrite or something, then it kind of throws a monkey wrench in there. Until there's a rewrite, then you've got to figure it out. But there was always – that was a good thing about Sean and all his planning. And, you know, in the early days, you got to be involved. I got to be involved in a lot of that planning exactly when we were going to buck the rewrite, exactly when he was going to come up uh, in the bull ride. You know, the, of course, everybody wants to stay and watch the bull ride to the yeah. last bitter end. So it was it'd be anticlimactic to try to buck one after. We tried to buck a couple of bulls after there one time, like to close the show out and buck a bull. And it was pretty anticlimactic for the contestant. It was pretty anticlimactic for the event. So we just tried to get them in there as fast as we could and get them bucked. So that contestant had the same mojo of the event going on that everybody else did. Yeah, the atmosphere yeah. and the – yeah, got the atmosphere. And the, the, the everybody was in that same mode of thinking, and the judges were in that same mode of thinking, and uh, gave that contestant a better opportunity, you know, to, to reach the full potential of his ride if he made if he made the whistle, you know. Yeah. Well, I think you ran a you you was a, you ran the shoots in the in the time period of 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 well of all my heroes anyway, and and when you go back and look of all the NFRs, them thirty years stand out as you you can't put in, put together a better set of thirty years. In the time from eighty two to well, twenty twelve, I mean that's pretty awesome. Donnie Gay coming out of retirement when his eighth. You there got you go. the bridalist scamper. You yep. got uh, Billy Atbire riding Cool Alley. Cody Hancock setting the arena record. Well, you got Jim Sharp riding all ten. Norman Curry riding Andrew, all ten. Adrian Adrian Rice Adrian. riding all ten. I mean, list goes wow. on. Three got three guys there. You know, three guys you just named out there that you know it's only been done. You know three times it i mean that's phenomenal you know there's a lot of stuff people don't realize too there was times when there was uh, only nine go rounds in nfr mm-hmm. there was one year they had 11 go rounds there's a lot yeah. of people don't even know little tidbits like that did you know that yeah. i i knew no. they i knew they had like nine eight or nine rounds at one time and then i'd heard somebody say something about 11 but i didn't know if how true it was yeah, there was 11 go rounds i can't remember it was before i started running the shoots i think it was about 70 I want to say seventy-eight or nine somewhere well, that was, there. Wasn't that we had Byron Walker on a, a couple of episodes ago, and he was talking about that it kind of went to the NFR was kind of a tournament style deal, and and the average basically the average winner at the finals wound up being the world champ. Yeah, was that it, it was sudden death? You know, Jack Moore, yeah. he won two titles that way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Monty Henson, he was involved in that one year. He won a world title that way. But, uh, yeah, it was it was a sudden death. Uh, and and I was thinking about that this morning. It was funny that you bring that up because it was – it really – I don't know what their goal was in doing that. I guess they were – they didn't want the NFR because at that time there wasn't enough money up for somebody to come in their 15th like Cody Hancock did and win the world. There wasn't enough money up at that time. Time. and i think they were trying to build more of a of a contest all all week long to have a you know a, a, a climax at the end of the event uh that would uh, they could really sell and i think that was their thinking behind that but i just don't think that it ever took off the contestants you know uh and it was uh it wasn't it wasn't well received of course you know the, there's always going to be a winner at an event it doesn't matter and you, the two times that jack won it there was no doubt he was the winner in the bareback riding you know yeah uh that guy just rode ph- phenomenal, you know, and, uh, you know, there are uh, the Byron Walkers and those guys, and those, there, there was some, those guys were, you look back at the cattle they ran, those guys were bulldogging Ooh. some big cattle. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> they were professional size. Yeah, they, they wasn't, they wasn't fresh off no ca- cows tit either. They, they'd been, they'd been <laughs> fresh there Fresh yearlings. Been in the feedlot yeah. for a minute. They, they, you know, them steers probably average five fifty, as I recall, in Oklahoma City, and sometimes some of them steers were six and a quarter. But you had great big guys like Byron Walker and Steve Duhon and mm-hmm. you know the Roy Duvalls and C. R. Bouchers and all them guys of those areas that were big men, uh, even way before my time. Guys like Nathan Haiti that were huge men, and and uh, Jim Bynum and those guys, they were, they were great big men. Mm-hmm. And uh, them getting a hold of six hundred pound steer wasn't no big deal, you know. Yeah. We talk wow. about those changes. What What do you think was the biggest change? 
of all the years you were there when it comes to the NFR? Uh, I think the biggest change was uh, uh, it, it probably in the time events was getting the cattle more consistent. Uh, you know, that and that and the riding event guys having more say so. You know, it, Cody probably doesn't even know this. Used to in Oklahoma City at the NFR way back, they would feature five horses in each event. So you'd go through there and you'd feature five horses in each event. You threw the rest of the chip in a sack and they started drawing in to fill the performances. So you could have a bull or a horse in a performance that was eliminator and somebody else would have the, the you know, the, the hopper in that pen. It was really uneven. But as time went on, they started, you know, well, we got to even up these pens. There's got to be more of an even draw. And that's when, the, you know, about, it was about probably 80, somewhere in there at 79, they started, uh, you know, scrutinizing the pens a lot more, the, and the contestants had more say so, and the directors were really paying attention to what was going in there and talking with the contestants, what bulls and what fit. And uh, there was many years at, at Vegas that the pens were just so even, it was hard to be for me to watch and judge an event. You couldn't hardly pick a winner because they were too even, you know, yeah. and everybody rode so well. But uh, it, it, that's how it progressed along from being uneven to sometimes being too even. Yeah. So that's some, that's some of the bigger changes that I saw, you know. Uh, of course, the, the money's always going to be a huge factor uh, growing, the, growing the event, which I don't know in this day and age, I don't know why a world champion doesn't get a million-dollar bonus in the PRCA. I don't understand that. I, I would love to see that for those contestants, you know. Uh, and I think that's something I'd like to see them work toward, you know. Yeah. Well, they was they had talk about moving it. You know, a couple of years ago, they had talk about moving the NFR to Florida. What would what was your thoughts on that? Oh, I think that would be a totally anticlimactic for the overall picture of the NFR. I mean, to me, Las Vegas is is the place for the NFR because there's so many things you can do, and it can house so many people, and there's so many people that can go and be a experience the NFR experience mm -hmm. without ever going to the event. And I think that, that, that of all the settings that you have out there, it probably is, is probably the most conducive setting for the NFR that there is anywhere. I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement there. Byron, he 100%. was talking about, Texas. you know, uh, when we had him on the other day, he was talking about how great it was in Fort Worth. And had it not been COVID, they could have filled that arena uh, down there and, and made it better for everybody. But, I maybe I'm just old school and just sentimental, and I, I I like the Vegas. Vegas is where where dreams are made and made or shattered. Well, there's I didn't get to go. I, I had a I could have went to the rodeo at, at at Arlington. I didn't go, but uh, the setup looked like it was phenomenal. You know, one thing, especially like in the in the horse ridings, it gets so fast. Sometimes those contestants they barely have time to get ready. I mean, it, it's it's hard. But with 12 bucket shoots, that looked like to me that made it a lot better for the contestants. And I'm like, Byron, I'd, I'd agree with him. If it wasn't a year of COVID, they probably would have filled that thing up. I think that, you know, that when when the NFR moved to Las Vegas, they were supposed to build an arena within five years specifically for the NFR to its specifications and everything. And I think the NFR could, could sell out a 25,000-seat house each night, which would make, you know, seven or eight more – thousand contestants be able to go to the nfr each night which would make it better but the thing about thomas and mac is so intimate there there's, there's not any many rodeos you can go to where you can sit right i mean you're right there you're you know? on it yeah and it's, and it's, it's such an intimate setting and everything you you feel such a part of even the seats i mean i've talked to we used to have customers when i worked for Copenhagen that would go and they, we'd have gold buckle seats and they would talk about how great it was to be that close down there to a calf roper or a steer wrestler or whatever to be able to sit that close like you were right there beside them watching the event and i don't think that the you know getting away it's like watching the football it's on tv it's so far removed mm -hmm. i think you would losing that would take a, a big part away from the nfr experience in the thomas and mac but i don't think they could duplicate that in a bigger facility somewhere else yeah i have no doubt they could sell it out i, I really don't i i think they could sell it out in 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 bfe somewhere you know the nfr is going to sell itself but you, I don't think you're going to create that that atmosphere anywhere else that you create in Vegas. No, I mean you know you know yourself like being behind the bucket shoot there, and you know you got 
you got Clyde Elsie Frost sitting right behind the bucket. You, you can talk to them before you get on your bull, you know, and mm-hmm. <laughs> things like that. And there's people that you, uh, through the years, I got to know that people had the same seats every year and you get to know them by first name basis and know their family. And, uh, they, you know, it was, it was phenomenal the things that went on there. Uh, and, and even the people watched the, behind the buckets used to watch the people in the grandstands was as good as watches anywhere you, anywhere you'd get. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you never know what you home. see in the crowd. But, you know, in Vegas, you know, riding Thomas and Mac, in, it, it'd be plumb full, you know. And it was, it didn't matter if it was the rank pin or the spinner pin, and you're in there and that, that electricity's in the air, and, and you, they do the opening, and I mean, the hair on the back of your neck stands up and just starts crawling. And I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here talking about it, and it's standing up on the back of my neck just thinking when they start, Michael you know, Buffer. do the intro and the playing the music and, and that, the electricity in there, it's just it's something about Vegas just brought a different element to it for me. No no doubt about it. I mean, uh, the closest thing I could c- compare to a contestant would be like run the shoots. That would be the closest thing to the same feeling that you got. But you would get that same feeling, you know, every night. It, was, it yeah. wasn't like it would happen one time and that was mm-hmm. it. Every night it was a new experience. And 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 it, it was so thick in there. Sometimes you could have cut it. I guarantee mm-hmm. with twenty seven butcher knives. Yeah, it, it was just all, it was all over you. It's like he's crawling on you. You know, yeah. you knew and you was, was at the it show. Was exciting. Yeah, you knew you was at the show then. So you, yeah, you, the was at, you was at the show with a big yellow shoot. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So was your was your goal to do it thirty times and then retire? Or did you not put yourself in in two thousand thirteen or? After was, after I had done it about twenty times, I thought, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to shoot for a goal here. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do it twenty five times. But after I did it twenty five times, I said, well, I'm gonna try to do it thirty times. <laughs> and uh, so uh, after the thirtieth time I done it, the, the World Series was really growing big, and the guy that ran that was a good friend of mine, and he wanted me to come over and help them run their deal, run their event off, and and so. Uh, it was, it was kind of a strange deal. It was going to be a, like a four or five year commitment, you know, and so I've agreed to do that, but didn't, it didn't last quite that long. But, but I had, I figured I had done my time. 30 years was long enough. I did put in for it one other time after that, but uh, I didn't get it. Uh, but, but 30 years, I mean, I was blessed to have it that many times and, and have, you know, never had any major meltdowns that where I was, you know, blew the show up, so to speak, or nothing. But there were so many people to cover you in there. You know, you just you had such good people everywhere. I'm talking from the sound to the lighting to every, everybody in there was first class. You know. Yep. And now, now, now you're making spurs and feeding cows. And now I'm making spurs and feeding cows. Yeah, that's what I, I always always had tinkered with building spurs in high school, and through that later on, then I kind of quit for a few years, and then after I retired, I kind of got back into it. So uh, that's that's kind of what I do every day now. Have you ever tried making horse bits? Yeah, I make a few bits. I don't try to make too many because I just like functional bits. There's uh, so many, yeah. you know, weird bits out there. I was in a, I was in our saddle house last night looking at all my wife's bits, and of course she runs barrels, and of course she roped and trained horses, but <laughs> she's got every kind of bits you can think of. And I'm thinking, my God, I wonder if everybody had this many bits. You know, I've got oh. about ten bits over there. And, there's about three of them that I rode all the time, but yeah, I, there was about three or four bits that I made that I just thought were real functional, and I didn't try to compete with those other guys because that's what they do. You right. Know? Well, I, I mean, I I played around building a few spurs and 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 went into making some bits just at the house, just basically because I was probably broke and needed a bit, and just well, I ain't gonna go buy one. I ain't gonna pay four hundred dollars for that bit. I'll just go make one something like it or something, and uh, I got played around with it a little bit. I never got real good at it, but. Uh, yeah, I've seen some. I think I got a set of your spurs that you had made. I think I won somewhere. It's got the DB on the inside of it. Oh yeah, probably so. Yeah, I've, I've donated a few for gifts and, and prizes. Yeah, they're pretty sharp. You but, still go to Vegas? I, uh, no, during the NFL. Twenty fourteen was the last year I was out there when I was working for the World Series. Was the last year I was there, and uh, it was it was it was tough those first couple of years not doing the NFR for so many years. Uh, but you know, like I said, I, I was blessed to have it that many times and, and I feel like I'd done my time and had a good run and it was time for me to move over and let somebody else go in. Tom, he's done a real good job doing it and he's got a good crew of people and it's, it's rolling on and 
the guy that's running now, Alan, he's doing a phenomenal job and everybody seems to really like him and he's uh, great to work for. And it just, it just moves on. You know, it, it, the NFR, the good thing about it, it attracts good people. So mm-hmm. every gate person or whatever job they got there, everybody is, is the best they can get, you know? Well, here's a question. Do you think, uh, anybody, the, the next shoot boss or, or shoot bosses in the future, do you think they have a little legitimate shot at, at, at having the job for 30 years? I don't know. It's, it's going to be, that's going to be, I've, I've thought about that. You know, uh, it's, that's going to be hard to say because I started when I was 30. I was pretty young when I started. Most of those guys that were on the shoots or, you know, Benny Butler, he was pretty young when he did it. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, it's a you got to you got to be number one. You got to be in the you got to be in the, the inside track, so to speak. You got to mm-hmm. have a, you got to have the ability to do it. You got to have the, the want to and the perseverance to, to be, produce the same results every night and try to meet that goal every night. Stay on track, whatever they were trying to meet. Uh, it would be hard, I think, for. I mean, it could be done, but it's going. It, it, it's a it's a long haul. Mm-hmm. It's a long haul. I was just thinking it might be harder now, Ben. It's got so fast paced, and you might get somebody to that'll that'll do it ten years in a row, and then there'll be somebody come along that that would better be better at it, and they move them in. It, it'd be harder because at the time that you run from eighty two to twenty twelve, the shoot boss was was a highly needed and and very important role, but it wasn't. I don't think it, it it's as flashy then as it is now i guess it's it, 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 the, the 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 demand for a shoot boss in our era was you know when you when, when even when i started those guys like the sunny lingers the buster ivories and all those guys that ran the buck and shoots they they were there and they were fixtures and they'd been doing it for years and they did them at the nfr and and but today at the rodeo you don't see many just shoot bosses guys like john ferris that ran shoots for steiners for years you know and then he works for Harper Morgan and Stacy Smith and other guys, but you just don't see many shoot balls. I know Frontier Tom Nunes he runs the shoots for them, but and you know you go to Benny's rodeo, you know he runs his own shoots. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know that Stacy's got people, and I don't know. I, I assume Pete Carr does, but I don't see him. You know, you, you just don't see many guys just gravitating toward that job and won't take it over anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I figure you probably hold the record for the most consecutive years shoot boss at the NFR. Well, I, I do now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this be uh, this be Tom Nunes. I think this will be his eleventh uh, year. I think to do it. Yeah, tenth uh, or eleventh, uh, and he's done a good job. He does a good job. He was he was one of my he was one of my students. He started out. Uh, chasing flanks for me in the arena and then he got moved up to opening bucket shoot gates and then we needed somebody to run the shoots and I uh, needed to assist it and I told Sean I said Tom Lewis can do it I said he does it for Sankey's and, and other people I said he can do it and uh, he was he, he fell right in there the biggest thing about being the assistant shoot boss is you got to set all them horses and bulls every night you know <laughs> and get them where they need to be and so not everybody could do that not everybody could visualize that yeah you know uh, just set all that stuff and get them where they need to be. Yeah, it, it takes a lot. A lot of people don't realize the planning and stuff to go back there because the first horse you buck is not necessarily the first one you load. Exactly. It, you got to load him you third, load. you know, and then and go up the line. Load. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it takes about uh, – every night it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to get all your paperwork done because the next day because your paperwork is the paperwork that the livestock superintendent works off of to sort the stock and then place all the animals where they need to be loaded from. Mm-hmm. And so everything keys off what you're doing, you know? Yeah. There's quite a bit of logistics back there. And a lot of people setting up in the stands, they just see the show. They don't know what's yeah. behind it or, mm-hmm. or anything. And that's, that's what's, that's what's neat about it. I think is, is the, the I'll, back. Behind I'll, tell the you, scenes. I'll tell you one good behind the scenes story. Roddy. Hey, one year was complaining to Gary McDaniels about the order because we weren't going exactly in order. You'd be out two or three mixed out a little bit there, but we were trying to get them horses where they need to be with those guys had the best shot to win the round on them. And so Gary said, I'll tell you what, Roddy, you just get up there not after rodeo and I'll just show you what we go through. Well, he got Roddy over there doing the bronc ride. Well, I, I'd always do the bareback ride and bull riding because I could do them in about, in, in that time period, Gary McDaniel, he would get to have the bronx done, have them all set and then we'd double check everything. 
Uh, anyway, he had Roddy Hay up there, and old Roddy Hay, he he wore two erasers off two different pencils, and his hair <laughs> looked—he looked like alfalfa. He had hair going everywhere, <laughs> and he finally finally threw his pencil down. He said, "Try this." After about two hours, we were sitting there waiting on him to get done. And uh, the next night, he went down to that bronc ride room. He said, "If anybody's got any complaints about what these guys were doing up there, he said, get up there and see, because these guys are doing a lot of work behind the scenes." <laughs> and I don't think they're getting paid for to do to make sure it's right for us. So I don't want to hear any more complaints from anybody, including me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Daryl, we uh, appreciate you coming on the show and hanging out with us and telling these cool stories. And uh, if you uh, go check us out on Pro Bull Talk on uh, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, uh, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and we'll catch you at the next one. Okay, guys, enjoy it. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Good talking to you, buddy.